Good morning, church. Good morning. Yep, you're figuring it out. It is wonderful to be with you this morning. Super, super excited to have you with us. Uh, really excited about uh, the service this morning. Uh, I did want to take just a moment before we go over our normal announcements uh, just to say thank you. Uh, we had some of our ladies get together and uh, they uh, got a big uh, box of stuff together. Um, several armloads of bags uh, for stuff we needed for the school cafeteria. So thank you so much for that. Um, it was truly a blessing, and uh, it, it it's exciting when people step in and see a need and are just willing to be a part. And they said anytime we need stuff, make sure they know. So that that is a blessing. So uh, from the school. Um, on behalf of the school, thank you for your love and uh, willingness to be a part. It truly, truly is a blessing. Well, I just have a couple announcements, nothing crazy this week. Don't forget tonight we will have uh, choir practice at 4.30. Is that right, Brother Nate? 4.30 we'll have choir practice. Um, immediately following choir practice, we will have the evening service. Super excited about that. But what I'm also excited about is this coming Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, everything will be over at the school. It'll be our first Wednesday night with the new classes that are starting up. There's still sign-up sheets out at the Welcome Center if you haven't done so. Or, and somebody did ask me a question last week about it. It was a great question, so I figured I would just publicly let you know. If you sign up for a class and it's... And for whatever reason you want to go to a... It's okay. You can do that, okay? You are not locked in. Correct, Pastor? Okay. Should have probably run that by him first. But <laughs> uh, but, but that's, that's the whole thing, right? So remember that the intent is not to do anything different. The, the intent in having the options is to reach more people and reach more people where they are and what specific needs they have, okay? Um, so I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be exciting. I also believe it will be more relational, and uh, we'll be able to get to know one another better. I believe we'll have a stronger, deeper, um, more biblical unity than even we do now. Um, so I'm really excited about it. So make sure you're here over at the school, 630 Wednesday evening, everyone will be over there. It's going to be really exciting to be a part. So if you come over here and it's dark, we didn't cancel. We're just down the street, okay? So make sure you're at the school, 630. Uh, ladies, don't forget, 11 o'clock next Saturday morning, okay? So just upcoming Saturday um, over at the school as well, right, Miss Elizabeth? Okay, at 11 a.m., it's the ladies' tea. All right, so ladies, if you've got any final questions for decorating, things of that nature, uh, make sure you see Miss Elizabeth, okay? So we don't have a whole lot of stuff going on. We're dwindling down. Uh, we're kind of getting a pause before everything gets crazy. We want to thank the Lord for the weather. Thank the Lord for all that he's doing. It truly is a blessing. If you're your first time visiting us, thank you so much for being here. We do not take it lightly. We do appreciate it. And please know that you are loved and appreciated. I'm going to have Pastor come to open us in prayer this morning. If the men and boys would like to come and meet him at the front, uh, we'll let Pastor get us going. Amen. Don't, don't forget if you have children in the school, uh, this afternoon at 3 o'clock, we're having a parent meeting over at the school about tuition for next year. So if you want to do that, introduce some of you to the new school board members and so on. That's at 3 this afternoon at the school as well. So let's, let's, uh, let's bow for prayer. Father, we thank you so much for giving us the opportunity of being here together to worship. Thank you for bringing these folks out, Lord. They have a heart to, to serve you and to love you and to know you more. God, I pray that you'd help us as we worship you. Um, help us to have a heart that, Lord, you recognize as pure, with pure intent. God, help us to have um, a mind that can absorb the truth that you want to give to us. Just to understand the message, Lord. Give us, give us the words that will carry us through the week. And uh, we'll thank you for that, Lord. We need you today. And uh, as much or more than ever before. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you, okay? We're going to have the, the children's change offering at this time. If you kids want to come up here and uh, get your cup, let's go gather up some, some change, all right?
it's going to be a baby. I'm not sure. Stand up. You guys ready to sing? Stand up, Ethan. Not time to go to sleep yet. Wait till Sunday school class. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> you ready? Jesus loves me. Here goes. Wait, wait, wait. Hold it. Start. Stop. Stop. Okay. Ready? Take a deep, deep breath. You ready? Let it all out. Try again. You have to think in your mind. I'm going to sing this really loud so everybody can hear the next county. You ready? Here it goes. Jesus, this I know. guys let's pray okay <laughs> father thank you for these children thank you lord for what you've done in their lives thank you father for giving them the opportunity to serve you their whole life i pray lord they will not regret that that they'll learn what it means and very young lord surrender themselves to, to live the best life they can possibly live in service to you in jesus name i pray amen amen god bless you guys Okay, amen. All right, I have a, we have a treat for you today. We have a special missionary with us, Brother James Jacobson. You see his table out in the lobby. And um, he has a ministry to small churches, helping churches. You've helped 14 church plants so far, right? Is that what you said? And multiple churches getting things uh, uh, for them, helping with chairs and pulpits and songbooks and everything the churches need. Uh, across the country, networks. I mean, even you, you had some songbooks go from England to Kentucky. And uh, I, they speak the same language. Uh, well, anyway, uh, so uh, so any, anyhow, uh, do you want him to you want to do the video first? Or you want to, okay, so we've got a little video he's gonna, we're going to show of um, his, his ministry. And then he's going to speak for a couple of minutes, kind of introduce what they do to you, okay? So you guys go ahead and let's roll that. God has given a man a vision, a vision for starting or building a church. There is a town that needs to be reached for Christ, people that need saved and discipled, Christians that need direction and encouragement. The vision is from God, the burden is there, but the resources are not. The experience is often limited the man needs help. And this is where the Old Lamplighters Ministries plays a part. The Old Lamplighters Ministries, we started it in 2020, uh, and uh, we'd seen stats that 4,000 churches were closing in a year, 
and we really had a burden to help America's churches continue to strive, continue to fulfill the gospel. The Old Lamplighters Ministries was started when James Jacobson also received a vision, a burden, to help struggling churches with their need. After pastoring for several years, God gave Brother Jacobson a new vision, a vision to help other pastors in need. In 2018, uh, our church had closed its doors uh, and after being in, uh, in existence since 1964. Uh, and my wife and I worked tirelessly to, uh, we really had a burden to empty the building and get everything out of it uh, before it was sold. Uh, and we, we, we were able to accomplish that to uh, get them everything that people had worked hard for, people had sacrificed for. Uh, God began to put a burden on our hearts to um, help more churches and, and it just kind of networked that way. Uh, Lord really used that burden and that passion to just put a spark for this ministry. The old Lamplighters ministry got its name and has been inspired by old street lamp lighters in 18th century Europe. The colonial era street lamps were lit by candles placed inside a glass vessel which kept the candle from being blown out by the wind. These lights were continually watched over and maintained. With the lamp being lit during the evening hours and snuffed out in the morning, without the care of a watchman, the light wouldn't be shining. The same principle applies to our churches as each church lights up their streets with the saving grace of our Lord and Savior. Uh, the same thing goes to our churches in America. If somebody cares, somebody helps a little bit and they can continue to shine their light. The Old Lamplighters Ministries maintains offices and a storage facility in Larwell, Indiana, where equipment, furniture, pews, and chairs are stored until given to church plants and growing churches. We get um, stuff donated from churches uh, that are either remodeling or have too many of or that kind of thing. We've been worked with several churches that have merged and we've come back after the merger and picked up items. Primarily it's, it's donated and then we in turn donate it to other ministries. We don't charge, we, we do try to cover our cost as transportation costs are expensive. We have helped ministries that uh, weren't able to pay us and that's okay uh, and, and uh, that's kind of our burden and desire behind it. In addition to providing equipment and furniture, the ministry also provides help with office and administrative structures and setup, can help train office personnel, organize bookkeeping, and help with building and vehicle maintenance programs. Uh, we've helped churches that were uh, unfortunately have closed and we were able to relocate their assets uh, to starting churches. Uh, we also help with VBSs and um, uh, pulpit filling and things of that nature. And thus far, the Old Lamplighters Ministry has helped at least 50 churches in 20 states as well as pastors and missionaries overseas. I firmly believe that uh, with our ministry, we, can, we can't help them all, but we can help quite a few, uh, and they can continue to present and preach the gospel uh, to a community that they're in. The Old Lamplighters Ministries works under the auspices of Come International Baptist Ministries of Pontiac, Illinois, a conservative Baptist mission agency that works with churches and missionaries worldwide to advance the cause of Christ. We are thrilled to have the Jacobsons with the Come International Baptist Ministry family. Uh, their ministry, they've got a burden like few others for uh, churches, for the lost, and their ministry is unique. They go in and help churches in any way they can, but uh, primarily just helping them get their hands on tools they need to carry out the ministry. And it's just a blessing to so many churches and has helped church plants uh, get started and other churches keep going. And he's been a blessing as well uh, to me personally as a pastor in helping with our administrative needs and, and paperwork things and record keeping and uh, another aspect of their ministry. So we're excited to have them and we encourage you to pray for them and to help them in any way you can to continue the ministry they have so the Lord can continue the ministry of so many others. Brother Jacobson is joined in this work with his wife, Phoebe. Always the end goal is to reach the lost and to give the gospel out because that's the main goal of Christians and the main goal of Jesus' heart. 
um, the big deal, I guess, would be to keep churches that need uh, help in any way. Um, if we can do that, we want to do that. When the pastor or his family are discouraged and worn down, this can often lead to feelings of being inadequate for the job. Many pastors feel they don't have any close friends in the ministry, and they oftentimes work many hours that go unnoticed. This can often lead to burnout and them resigning. We really try to be that listening ear and that friendship that they can have someone to talk with. This takes a lot of time to build that relationship, but eventually the Lord often allows us to encourage and help build back the burden they once had for their community. Brother Jacobson's burden is for people, people to be reached by the local New Testament church. Uh, our, our, one of our slogans on our website is that they'll have their lamps burning bright. And, and we firmly believe that, that everyone we can help, they can continue to shine their light in their community and preach the gospel and keep the pastors encouraged and families uh, going for the Lord. In centuries past, lamplighters provided a critical service to the people of a community, helping to provide light to people who would have to live and function in darkness. They were a critical part of their old time communities and were always a blessing. Today, the Old Lamplighters Ministries wishes to do the same. Help provide materials and resources needed to get the light of the gospel out to cities and towns in spiritual darkness. Like the fire was a tool used to do this, so is their desire. A desire to be a tool used by God to help pastors and churches spread the light of the gospel. This is the vision of the Old Lamplighters Ministries. Would you consider joining us in this vision? Um, as the video says, it, it pretty much explains our ministry, our, our drive, our desire. Uh, we really do have a burden to come along beside the small churches and help. Uh, the Lord is really blessed. Like uh, we said in the video, we've been helped over 50 churches now uh, since 2020. Uh, the Lord really put a burden in our heart to come along beside. We don't want to take anything over. We don't have a desire to, to run somebody off. That's We don't work like that. But uh, we really want to encourage the pastors and, and uh, help the churches continue on and preach the gospel. Uh, covet your prayers. We do a lot of traveling. Last year, we did about 9,000 miles running for the for our ministry uh and please pray for us and and if you have any questions i'll be out at the table and and uh, uh follow us on facebook we got a website that kind of thing and uh, thank you pastor and fam church family for allowing us to come today Jesus saves, Jesus saves, and the one 
Jesus bow before him. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. See the sky alive with praise, melting darkness in his place. There is life forevermore in Jesus saves. With our sorrows sharing, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. He will die our burden bearing, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. It is done, well shout the cause. Christ is made redemption's cause. How the empty tombs declaring, Jesus saves. Freedom calling, chains are falling. Hope is dawning, bright and true. Day is waking, night is breaking.
dismiss the children at this time the children's church wow what a blessing what a blessing glad to be in church today right i'm telling you what my blesser was getting blessed in that music yeah praise
Praise the Lord. John chapter 8, I want to begin in John chapter 8 today. John chapter 8, we're going to read verse 42. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me. For I, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. We're starting a series today that will run up through Easter on why Jesus came in his own words. There's over 24 references in the Bible, 24 times Jesus said, this is why I came. These are the reasons I came. Sometimes in our churches, uh, in, our, in our faith, in our walk, we, we get distracted by different things. Things catch our attention. We get afraid. We're afraid of change. We're afraid of different things. And at any, any time that happens to us, we need to stop, back up, and look again at why Jesus came. What was his purpose? What was his goal? And uh, this morning, uh, being the first message in this series, there's some things I want to point out to you and maybe answer some questions for you um, in some of the things that you're seeing, even in the things that are going on around us. Um, some confusion happens when we, we think about Israel and all of that, what that means. And I hope I can answer some of those questions for you in this morning's message. Um, why did Jesus come? Why did Jesus come? We're going to look at three of the statements this morning, not all 24. Uh, in fact, we aren't going to cover all 24 in the next four weeks. But, but just so you know, you can, you can look them up yourself. There's a lot, of, a lot of good stuff in there. We're going to go back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. I want to talk for a minute about the first thing Jesus said when he came out on, into, into the, in the human race. The first thing he said when he began to teach of why he came. In verse 17 of Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says this, Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever, therefore, shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. The first thing I want you to see is this. Jesus came to fulfill the law. He did not come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. There's a lot of confusion in our churches in America today. For some reason, I don't know why. Well, yes, I do. People don't read their Bibles. But anyway, there's a lot of confusion in, in the world today about the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. I know a lot of preachers will get up and they'll say, I only preach the New Testament because that's all, all that God wants me. This is a New Testament, Bible believing, Baptist church, whatever, whatever. Okay, so the problem with that is this book right here is one story, one complete unit. Everything from Genesis to Revelation is about one thing. That's about Jesus Christ coming to this earth and introducing himself to us. It's about him connecting us to our source again. It's about him connecting us to the Father. Uh, people misunderstand that the Old Testament, they think maybe that was God's bad idea, and then he kind of kicked it out when he came to the cross. Jesus came to the cross to fix what he messed up. That mentality is exactly why Islam even exists. Islam exists because they believe that Jesus did not finish the thing that he came to, to finish, and so that he, God had to send Muhammad to finish it. Uh, that's the same mentality we have in the church. We think, oh, the Old Testament didn't work, and so God had to come and come up with a new deal, a new idea. That's not it at all. From the very beginning of the Bible and before, the Bible tells us, the mystery that was hid in the world was hid from before the, the beginning. This book is not a, a, a path change or a... A uh, different idea or a, a U-turn. This book explains the story from one 
all the way to the end, from A to Z, as it were. Jesus said, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the A and the Z of the Bible. That's what he's saying. It's one complete story, and that's important for us to understand. In Galatians chapter 3, if you turn there real quickly with me, Galatians chapter 3, we're going to read a few verses here, uh, beginning with verse 21. Galatians chapter 3, verse 21 is where we're going to start. He said, is the law then against the promises of God? So the law is not against the promises of God. You're going to find in the Old Testament, grace, mercy, Abraham, the Bible said, believe God, and that was counted for righteousness. Noah found grace. Noah, Abraham, all of these guys, none of them worked their way to heaven. There's people that say that salvation in the Old Testament was by faith plus works. Is that right? No, never, ever, ever has salvation been by faith plus works. People say, well, they had to have works in the Old Testament. No, 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 no. If works saved them, the Pharisees would have been saved. Jesus said, your righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. If works saved anyone at any time, they have whereof to glory. Works never saved anybody and never saved anybody in the Old Testament. It doesn't save anybody in the New Testament. So let's go back to Galatians again. He says in verse uh, ch or chapter 3, is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. So if there was a law that could be given to give life, then righteousness would have been by the law. But there wasn't. It wasn't given for, for life. For the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So what was the purpose of the law? The purpose of the law was simply this, to state that all of us are sinners. To show us that we're all sinners. None of us can, can do it right. None of us have got it figured out. Sometimes you sit there and you read, I remember as a kid reading uh, biographies of great men of God, James, uh, you're just thinking about those great guys and you think, wow, well, if I could only, if I could only. Oh, listen, they were humans just like we are. Somewhere in our, in our world, we have this idea that there's somewhere somebody that understands it all. Stay with me. That's where conspiracy theories come from. Oh, there's this cabal. There's this group of 13 people in a back room somewhere in Sydney, Australia, or somewhere else, and these people are the ones that actually run the world. Well, you know the president can't even keep his, his, his thoughts straight some days, so there's got to be somebody behind, run, well, there probably is, but anyway, <laughs> running things, right? Well, you know, there, it takes a lot of people to run the world, but you know what? Listen, there's not some conglomerate of people that are smarter than you there isn't. Everybody's human. We're all sinners. Everybody has agendas. Looking for, this is how we're going to get it done. Everybody has to, success, people that are successes are successes in the same way other people are successes. We all have the same tools, the same amount of time. We all have 24 hours in a day. You use it how you want to use it. You spend it how you want to spend it. Right? Don't get the idea that if we get the right guy in the, in the White House, it's going to fix all of our woes. It's not going to happen. We're all just people. And the law does that for us. The law reminds us that we're all the same. All of us under, under Christ. Verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith, which would afterwards be revealed. Verse 24. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. The law teaches us that we need Jesus. I'm going to tell you something, parents, that you have little kids, I want, you, I want to help you with something. Law is very, very critical before their prefrontal cortex works. They have to know there are lines they cannot cross. That no means no. If no means, well, I'm going to count to five, and then we'll count to ten, and then we'll figure out if we can actually get you to manipulate you into doing what we want you to do, that's not how you teach children. Children need to learn that when they do something wrong, it hurts. 
They need to learn that no means no. That's what they need to learn. It'll help you if you get that figured out. Um, you know, uh, the law, boy, I, I don't know about you guys, but I, I like to give mercy to the kids. I like the kids, when they send them to my office, say, this kid's been bad. I'm like, okay, let's talk to him for a minute. All right, you need to straighten up, right? Okay, now here's a piece of candy. Go back and do better. That's what I, you know, I'm sorry. I'm grandpa kind of thing. Um, I'm not very good at this anymore. Kind of lost, lost the habit. My kids are looking at me like, who are you? Uh, and it's not who we remember. Uh, the truth is, the truth is, law is what helps them understand grace. If you don't understand law, you do not understand grace. If you do not understand cause and consequence, you are not grateful to be forgiven. You become entitled. Hello? Does that sound familiar? If you don't understand law and all you understand is grace, you become an entitled Christian. Does that make sense? You guys understand that word, right? Entitled. That's what's wrong with our culture right now. Well, let's not tell kids no. Let's encourage them. You say, that's nice, but you could do it this way better. Why don't you just look at them and say, no, that was stupid. Do that again, you'll be like your cousin Jimmy. Who's my cousin Jimmy? Exactly. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Some of you got that, right? It was in our house. It was your brother Jimmy. And uh, I said, we didn't know we had a brother Jimmy. If you keep doing that, you're going to find out why. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, Matthew chapter 18 I want to show you something the Bible tells us in Matthew 18 verse 11 for the son of man is come to seek and to save that which is lost we, know, we see that why did Jesus come he came to seek and to save that which is lost right how think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety nine which went not astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. What are we talking about here? I don't know if you realize this, but when Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost, he was aiming at Israel. If you remember, the Syrophoenician woman came to Jesus and said, Sir, my daughter is possessed with a demon. Will you come? And he looked at her and he said, I shouldn't give, we shouldn't give the food to the dogs that's meant for the children, right? That's what he said. He looked at her and he called her a dog. It's like, What? See, his goal at that point was to rescue Israel. His number one goal was to rescue them and get them back on track. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. Israel had lost its way. What was the purpose of Israel? Israel, Israel was not elected to be saved. They were elected to serve. They were elected to tell the world about God. In Romans chapter 3, verse 1, it says, What advantage then hath a Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way. Chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. What, what, was, what was given to, what were the oracles of God? Well, the law was the oracles of God. Verse 3, For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written that thou mayest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. He said, For if our, but if our righteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? Listen, here's what he's talking about. Verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. The law was given to the Jews to preserve, to keep. It was given to share with the world exactly what God intended and what God expected. If you'll remember, how many of you remember the story of Jonah? Remember the story of Jonah? What was Jonah's problem? 
God told Jonah, Jonah, I want you to take the message of redemption to the town of Nineveh. I'm going to destroy Nineveh. Go tell them I'm going to destroy them. Jonah goes in. He was very believable. I mean, he'd spent three days and three nights in the belly of a whale. He was probably covered in seaweed, stunk like fish vomit. His skin was white, probably burned white from the, the stomach acids. It would have been awful when he came in, holes, uh, uh, clothes with holes in him, ripped. It looked like he, you know, looked like he'd spent the night in a whale's belly. You realize that he would have would have been and so as he walked into the town preaching about God they stopped and said oh what is this unless we're gonna believe this guy and they turned their hearts to God they, they got they repented and Jonah got mad remember that Jonah goes out and sits down and he said I knew you're gonna do that God if I preached repentance to them they would repent think about this that's what he was supposed to be doing Israel was supposed to be given the message of God to the entire world and they lost their way they got wrapped up oh stay with me here folks they got caught up in their systems and traditions they got wrapped up in this is the way you do things oh your blue border is not wide enough ah you need to buy your blue borders from this people these people oh you got the wrong shaped tambourine my friend that's what they did they got completely wrapped up in traditions and rules of men completely wrapped up in it I lost what they were supposed to be doing same thing that's happened to the church exact same thing that's happened to the church look what Romans 11 says I'm gonna read this whole chapter Stay with me. Listen to what the Bible says. I'm reading the whole chapter because you need to understand what he's saying. I say then, have God cast away his people? This is what people are preaching nowadays. There's people saying that God got rid of Israel and that he's replaced him with the church. We call this replacement theology. Has anybody ever heard that? Replacement theology. They say, okay, we're, they used to call it British Israelism because they said that, that Britain was the the lost tribe of Israel that actually is really Israel and it's a whole thing some guy out in Arizona preached this and now they call it replacement theology and it's got different terms and different names and basically what they're saying is that Israel is no longer anymore and now we just it's just the church the church completely replaces Israel what does Paul say about this hath God cast away his people God forbid for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Here, here, here it is for all those people that believe in replacement theology. Here it is, verse 2. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Paul said it flat out. He did not do that. Well, you know what the scripture say? The Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? He said, I've reserved to myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. A remnant of Israel. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Hmm, that was made sense, right? What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for. But the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According, according as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David said, Let their table be made a snare, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see, and bow down their back alway. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, you ready for this? Salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I might provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. He's talking about 
trying to get his Israel back, back on track and getting them to pay attention. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? So what's he going to do? God's going to bring them back in. For if the first fruits be holy, that's Israel, the lump is also holy. If the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches, Israel, be broken off, and thou, Gentiles, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in amongst them, and with them partakers of the root and fatness of the olive tree, he said, you're getting to partake of everything Israel. We're in here preaching Old Testament stuff, and we're Gentiles. And we get a piece of it, and we're Gentiles. This is what he's saying. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Now we'll say then the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. He said, oh, God's done away with Israel so that I could be part of the church. He said, well, because of unbelief they were broken off. And thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. So if Israel believes, begins to believe, they will be grafted back in. Let me stop right there. We don't have time to read the rest of it. But let me tell you something. The Bible says there's going to come a day when Israel's going to look at him and say, what are these wounds in my hands? And he's going to say it was where I was wounded in the house of a friend. And they're going to say, my Lord and my God. Right now, guys like Ben Shapiro, their eyes are blinded. They're not obnoxious to Christians. Ben, I've heard Ben many times say that he respects Christianity. He tries to understand Christianity. He listens to Christianity. He's not turned away from Christianity. He doesn't say it's stupid. He doesn't say it's wrong. He, he listens to it. He respects it. But I'm going to tell you something. There are blinders on his eyes. He doesn't quite see it. Okay? As an Israeli, the only way he can come to God is by faith in Jesus Christ, and if he will recognize that Jesus Christ is the sacrifice, the fulfillment of the law that he preaches, he will be saved. Only the Jews that see that will be saved. But they'll be grafted back in. Let me tell you something. There will come a time where the nation of Israel, just like the church, will come back into favor with God and will be preaching in the world just like the church is. They'll be grafted back in. All the children of Israel, are they all saved? No. No. They thought they were. They thought they were all going to heaven just because they were the seed of Abraham. And that's why the second thing I want you to see in Matthew 10, why Jesus taught them this. Matthew 10, verse 32, he said, Whosoever therefore will confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to send peace on the earth. You ready for this? I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. One of the things you have to understand when you're studying the Bible, trying to understand what the Bible's saying, you have to understand the historical context. One of the, the, one of the, the Bible studies Brother Paul's going to be teaching on Wednesday nights, uh, starting this Wednesday night is back Bible background, history background of the Bible to, to help you understand. One of the things you have to understand when Jesus said, I came to bring a sword, you have to understand what he's talking about. Stay with me here. What is he talking about? What is this sword he's speaking of? Over and over again, he said he came to seek and to save that which was lost. The sword at first, first blush looks like it's something that's horrible, something to cut, something to break, something to ruin. It was a foreign concept to the Jews. If you go back to John chapter 8, we won't go there now for the sake of time. But John chapter 8, they said, we're of Abraham's seed. And Jesus said, I know you are, but you're of your father the devil and his works you will do. See, they thought, stay with me, stay with me. They thought that because they were Abraham's seed, that they were going to heaven automatically. There's people in this room that think that because they go to a certain church 
or were raised in a certain church or have a certain background, that they're more likely to get closer to the throne than other people. Same idea. There's people in here that think, well, I've always been a Christian. I'm a Christian because I hang out with Christian people. My parents are Christians, or I grew up in a church. I've always been a Christian. There's people that think that. Maybe not in here because if you've been listening, I've been preaching about that for a while. But maybe there is somebody here like that. These Jews, they thought, Brother James, just because they were the seed of Abraham, it was an automatic shoe into heaven because they did all the things that they were supposed to do. Give me a list of things, they'll say to me. Preacher, give me a list of things. Let me know what this list is. If I can do all the things on the list, I know I'll be a member in good standing. I want to know. People want to know. What's the list? Anybody can do a list. Are we supposed to, the lady's supposed to wear head coverings? Okay, got that one. We're supposed to kick our TVs out? Okay, got that one. You know, whatever. We have these list things that we, we say to make us feel like we're holy, right? And we do all those things, and if we do all those things, then we think, I got this, right? Jesus said, I come to bring a sword. I'm going to divide families. I'm going to divide homes. Just because you grew up in church doesn't mean you got into heaven. Just because your family is all singing on the platform, Shrocks. I mean, God bless you guys. You're a testimony. Your family's a testimony. But you kids even think about it. It's very visible. I pick on you guys because you're visible. There's a lot of you, right? Just because you all come to church in the same van doesn't mean you're getting to heaven in the same vehicle. Right, Nate? See, the sword that Jesus came to bring, are you, are you with me here? Is that salvation is not a family decision. It's a personal decision. That's the sword he brought. He came to divide families and say, just because it's your kid doesn't mean they get to go to heaven. See, the difference between me and maybe the Lutheran church the Lutherans baptize babies. You know why they baptize babies? So you say, well, if we baptize them, they get to go to heaven because they're our kids, and therefore we sanctify them by baptizing them. So now they're a shoe into heaven. Catholics do the same. That's why they baptize babies. Jesus came to bring a, a sword and say, look, you all have to make your own decision. And there will be people in your home that are going to choose God, and there are going to be people that, are, that won't. Hello? Is that broken? Let me tell you something. When my wife and I first had our first child, Ryan, and then Zachary came along, and then Katie came along, and now we have our bonus child, Sierra. I want to tell you something. Listen, when we were in that hospital room and that baby came to life for the first time, I was freaked out you know why not because I thought we could keep from killing them <laughs> you know as new, new parents a lot of times are afraid you're going to kill the baby in the first week I mean it's one of the fears that wasn't what I was afraid of I was afraid of bringing somebody in the world that was going to spend eternity in hell and for me that was horrible I can't imagine. I couldn't imagine. I've seen families with children going this way, that way, helter-skelter, not serving God. And I'm like, I, I'm going to do everything in my power. I'm going to give my entire life. My, my wife and I, we gave our entire lives to ensure that our children go to heaven. And now we got grandkids we're working on. One, anyway. One on the way. You know what? Why? Because it's important to me. Because, you see, they're not going to get to heaven just because grandpa's a preacher. Some of you guys have, have family members that love God and maybe preachers in, in, your, in your history. That didn't mean you get to go to heaven. The sword cuts you away from everyone else. The sword is what makes it a personal decision. We celebrate the fact that Jesus is my personal Savior. What that means, my friends, is you don't get to ride anybody's coattails. 
And if you're here today and you've never put your trust in Jesus Christ, you're counting on the fact that you've always been a Christian, my friend. It's time to take a long look inside because that's why Jesus came, to make it a personal decision. Third thing, and we're done. Matthew 20. He says in verse 20, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. I wish I had time to, to, to unpack all of this. It's a whole sermon in and of itself. They wanted his, her son, she wanted her sons to sit on the right hand or the left, and he said, it's not mine to give. Verse 24, when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and that and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. For whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. So Jesus came for what purpose? Look what it says in verse 27. And whosoever shall be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as, look at this, the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom. The purpose was to give, not to get. Jesus came to be a minister. Listen to me, church. Listen to me. Listen to me well. Listen to me. Everybody listen to me. People choose churches on what they can get out of it. That is wrong. You choose a church on what you can give. You choose a church that gives you the vehicle to minister. Look for places you can serve, not just in the church, but through the church, with the church, with the help of the church. Look for places you can serve. And if your church doesn't have a vehicle that you can serve in, your job is to make the vehicle. You say, well, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I, man, I, I like to go door-to-door -door visiting on Thursday nights. Well, God bless you. Start going door-to-door -door visiting on Thursday nights. So, well, the church doesn't have a program. Church doesn't need a program. You're supposed to bring the program. Who do you think does it? Who do you think does it all? Well, we pay the pastor. Well, God bless you. We pay the pastor to show up every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. We don't really want to, but we pay him so he has to. Look, you're the church, not me. I'm the spokesperson. I'm God's mouthpiece for you. I'm a gift God gave to this church. For God gave some apostles and some pastors and teachers for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. But that body of Christ, I'm supposed to edify you. Why? Because you are the program. You bring the program. Well, nobody will help me. Who cares? Jesus came to minister, not to be ministered unto. Well, I don't know. I didn't get anything this morning. That song was too loud or it was too soft or the mix was wrong or I couldn't even understand the words or blah, 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 blah. So that's why you come to church to be ministered to. Jesus didn't come for that reason. If you want to follow Jesus Christ, the path of Christ is to minister, not to be ministered unto. I want to show you something here real quick, and we'll wrap this up. It said he gave his life, watch this, a ransom for many. I was talking to a pastor friend of mine this morning about this because it occurred to me for the first time that he used the word ransom. That's an interesting word. Ransom. Do you know our world has been kidnapped? I appreciate you guys praying for the situation. My family with my niece and her family pray specifically tomorrow. They're supposed to appear before court, hopefully to get the last paperwork so they can get out of the country they're in. Keep praying about that. Thank you for the gifts that have been given. We have enough to get them out of the country as soon as the paperwork comes together. It's supposed to be before a judge tomorrow. Pray that that works. I hope they can get out. Right now they're in hiding. Kidnapping is a big problem in America. It's a big problem all over the world. And you know what a kidnapper does? You've seen the movies. You ever seen The Ransom of Red Chief? That's the funniest one I've ever watched. Uh, that, was, that was great. If you haven't seen it, you need to, you need to read, it, read the book or something. 
ransom of Red Chief. The, the fact is kidnappers will kidnap a child and then they'll put him up for ransom. They'll say to the parents, they'll say, pay us and we'll give you your child back. Right? And the ransom of Red, Red Chief, the kid was such a brat that the dad just kept waiting and waiting, and eventually the kidnappers paid him to take the kid back, which is a great story. The, uh, the ransom. You see, in Matthew chapter 4, we talked about this last week and the week before. Matthew chapter 4, Jesus was in the wilderness being tempted of the devil. And the devil said to him, come up to this high mountain. Let me show you all the kingdoms of the world. I will give you if you'll bow down to me. Jesus said, don't give them to me. I'm going to pay for them. The devil is hijacked and kidnapped. 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 He's knopping all the time. He kidnapped the, the whole world. He's kidnapped souls. He's kidnapped people. And Jesus Christ said, I'm not going to take that free. I'm going to pay for it. I'm going to pay your price. I'm going to pay it. It's going to be a little more than a golden fiddle. <laughs> Thank you, James. Pagan. How do you know what I'm talking about? It was in my cassette player. <laughs> I left it behind. <laughs> God, God built the world. He made the world. The devil hijacked it. He claims he owns it. He claims it. And the truth is, he owns a little bit of it. He owns the fame. He owns all of that stuff. And he wants, he wants you to take it. Now, he's got a hook behind it. Jesus said, no, you're not going to owe me. I'm not going to owe you anything. When I'm done, the debt's going to be paid in full. Everything you ever needed, everything you ever wanted, the souls that you've claimed, I'm paying everything for it. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus Christ paid the ransom. He came to give he didn't come to get. Listen, across our world today, churches are all about getting money. Ministries are building because they're trying to get money. People are getting money because in some cases they want to live opulent. Not every church is that way. But you see these television ministries where these guys have 47 houses in different places and all this money that comes into them. And the bigger the church gets, the bigger their salary gets. And they're just sucking it in and becoming living off of people's sacrifices listen you don't hear me talk about tithing you don't hear me talk about giving if you don't give i learned something a long time ago if god wants it to happen he will supply his own way he does it you don't hear me yelling about it all the time because i know if you don't give tithes and stuff we can't pay the bills but i've known times when we couldn't pay the bills and god gave it somewhere else gala we've seen that recently haven't we a few times hallam you've seen it too we, we've seen it happen where where when the money the money's not there from the offerings god gives it a different way because god never sends you out and gives you a job to do without supplying the needs he does it right you don't hear me talking about that all the time. You know why? Because the church is not here to collect your money. I love the fact that COVID drove us to put in boxes in the, in the, in the lobby back like the, in the Old Testament times. Old Testament times, that's what they had. They had a boxes. The tre they called it the treasury. People would give when they come to the temple. I hate sticking a plate in front of people unless it's a cup and a kid and change. It's different, right? But I, I hate putting plates in front of people's faces and say, you better give. Show everybody how much you're giving. If you don't put something in the plate, money, that's a problem. I, I don't like that kind of business. I never, I've always hated it. You know what? You need to give what God wants you to give. Give what's in your heart to give. And it's between you and God. This church can exist without you. Let me say that again. Let me say that louder for everyone. This church can exist without you if God's in it. 
You say, well, preacher, I don't like what you're doing. I'm going to hold my tithe and give it to somebody else. That's between you and God. I don't really care. I'm going to do exactly what I believe God wants me to do, and that's what you want me to do. What I do is not tithe to what you, or is not tied to what you give because I didn't come to get your money. Trust me. I can get money a lot easier somewhere else in other ways. I came to give. That's what you should do. Because that's what Jesus did. That's what picking up your cross is all about. Giving yourself. Giving yourself for others. Being a minister. Finding ways you can help someone else. Just a simple thing. I've given a cup of cold water to somebody. Somebody, an older person here in the service, sitting there, struggling, coughing. Somebody gets up and goes, gets them a cup of water. Boy, that's a blessing. Here's a kid running through. Stop him. Give him a sucker. Wow, that's a blessing. Give somebody a throat lozenge. Give them, give them some cookies, amen? Mm, I was thinking about that for a minute. Pause for a moment of silence. Mm. My wife made these brownies. They're small things. She said they're for something else, but I'm testing. Make sure they're okay for something else. Lord have mercy. I'm telling you what. You're here to give just like him. Do you get the point? Give yourself. Give yourself. Let's bow our heads. If you're here today and God spoke to you and you said, you know what? I have always, my entire life, I have tried to do good things to get God's attention. I've tried to behave because I wanted God to notice me. Maybe you felt like, wow, preacher, I, I grew up in church. I've always been a Christian. No, you haven't. Jesus said you must be born again. You have to be born again. That new birth comes. Boy, listen. It comes only from a personal choice you make. If you're here today and you've never made that personal choice, I challenge you to do it today. That's why Jesus came. To separate you from the crowd. He knows your name. He knows every thought and intent in your heart. He knows everything about you. And he came to save you. Salvation is about you. Ask him. Ask him right now. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you just call on him, he'll hear you. And he'll separate you out for himself. Ask him. If you don't know how to ask him, just say, Father in heaven, I know I'm a sinner. I know I need to be saved. I know I need the new birth. I can't do it myself. Please forgive me and save me. Be my personal Savior in Jesus' name. If you prayed that with me and you haven't before, would you lift your hand up and let me know quickly, anybody across this room? Prayed that prayer with me this morning. If you're here today and you're a Christian, understand God expects you to give yourself just like he gave himself. I want you to think about that. Go out of here thinking about what you can give, not what you can get. That's why he came. That's why you're here. Father, thank you for your word. Use it in our hearts today. Thank you for Brother James and his ministry. Pray that you bless it and give the supply that he needs. And if you could use us to help him with that, Lord, I pray that you'd move on our hearts to do so. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.